Now, at the end of yesterday's lesson, we said that um, there were a number of factors that would affect the rate of a chemical reaction. And just remember what the rate of a chemical reaction is. The rate of a chemical reaction is, for all intents and purposes, the speed of a chemical reaction. Okay. And having studied rates of reactions thus far, we know that most chemical reactions are very, very fast in the beginning. Then they slow down and then they come to a stop. Okay. Now, if there's a chemical reaction that perhaps happens too quickly or a chemical reaction happens too slowly, there are special chemicals out there, usually coming from that bunch of metals that we call the transition metals, that have the ability to alter the rate, okay? And they're called catalysts. And we finished yesterday's lesson on these. So the first thing I need you to know about catalysts is the definition. Because number one, it's a substance, okay? It's a substance. It could be in liquid form or it could be in solid form, but it's a substance, a chemical. And what it does is it alters the rate of a chemical reaction. But most importantly, not only does it alter the rate of a chemical reaction, it remains chemically unchanged itself at the end of that chemical reaction. All right. So the first thing you need is your definition, which I've now put up there on the screen. A catalyst is a substance that alters the rate of a chemical reaction whilst remaining chemically unchanged. It is the presence of a catalyst that is important, not the quantity. So whenever we're using catalysts from now on, you'll always hear the instructions tell you to take the pinch or a pinch of a, a, a catalyst or the top of a spatula full of a catalyst, not a full spoon. You don't need two spoons of catalyst to do the job. The presence of a catalyst is enough, okay? Because the chemistry that happens in the presence of a catalyst will happen as long as the catalyst is there, okay? Catalysts will be studied in more detail, and that's what I'm going to do in today's class. I'm just going to take a look through the various type of mechanisms we have for the action of a catalyst and the different types of catalysis that takes place involving chemical reactions. So first of all, what are they? Okay, what are catalysts? If somebody said to you, forget the definition, but just tell me, what is a catalyst? All right. First of all, they are substances that engage a chemical reaction to find an alternative pathway and then they themselves will remain chemically unchanged at the end. So you can recover a catalyst at the end of a chemical reaction. No, normally we don't in the lab because we're using very, very small quantities. But in industry, you have catalysts that are used over and over and over again. And I suppose the best example of reusing a catalyst is in your car. Every car nowadays has to have a catalytic converter. And the catalytic converter is a honeycomb box filled with precious metals of rhodium, platinum and palladium. And what they do is they manage to turn the harmful noxious gases into harmless gases before they are actually emitted from the car. OK, and they're used every single time that you run the engine of the car. So they're used over and over and over again. Now, over time, catalysts will become tired and less efficient. OK, I suppose one put it another way, more inefficient. So eventually catalysts will have to be changed, but not for a good long time. Catalysts are quite good at doing what they have to do for quite some time. They tend to be very specific in their action. So therefore, here's an example I have here. Platinum. When we come on to organic chemistry, please God, next year, <clears throat> we'll be talking about platinum as being the metal that allows the addition of hydrogen onto organic substances. OK, now, are there other things out there that might do it? Well, nickel might do it as well, but not as well as platinum does. So therefore, platinum has one job to allow hydrogen to add quickly to organic compounds so that we can create new organic compounds. All right. And then we also have, as we had the last day, that black powder, manganese dioxide, which we add to hydrogen peroxide in order to decompose it. And again, it has one job, and that is to allow the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide very, very quickly. So they're specific in their action. The presence, as we said already, is all that is required. Larger amounts have negligible effects on the rate. So one spoon, two spoons, three spoons, not going to have much of an effect on the overall rate of reaction. The very first addition of catalyst is the one where we notice the greatest change in reaction rate. OK, so always remember sparingly use catalysts. Catalysts will alter the forward and backward rates of a reaction of a system in dynamic equilibrium by the same degree. Now, that just simply means there are some reactions out there that can go forward as well as backwards. We'll be studying dynamic equilibrium in far more detail next year. But there are chemical reactions A plus B give C plus D. And as C plus D build up in concentration, they begin to react and reform A plus B. So you've got this wonderful cyclic process happening in the system. A plus B gives C plus D and C plus D gives A plus B. And it goes on in a loop in a closed system almost forever. OK, if it's a case that I find a catalyst that can speed up the reaction of A plus B into C plus D, then at the same time, it will speed up C plus D into A plus B. 
And likewise, if I can find a, chem a, a catalyst that will slow down A plus B making C plus D, then also will it slow down C plus D giving back A plus B. So if you have a reversible reaction, both reactions are, the, the rate I should say, both reactions are changed by the same catalyst. Catalysts will be destroyed if they are introduced to certain poisons. Now, arsenic will corrupt your enzymes. And if you go back over Agatha Christie films or stories or books, if anybody's ever read Agatha Christie, you'll find out that arsenic was a great Victorian um, killer. Okay, Arsenic was put into people's tea to kill them because it was untraceable in the human body. So arsenic interferes with enzymes, enzyme activity. And we are nothing more than an enzyme university. That's how we work. Our bodies are enzyme universities. We have so many enzymes controlling so many things that if they start to be interfered with or their action is stopped, we get into serious trouble, Okay, leading to death, obviously. Lead is what destroys the catalytic converter in a car. So if people put leaded petrol into a car, they're in serious trouble if they have a catalytic converter because the lead interferes with the action of the platinum, palladium and rhodium and stops the efficiency of changing the harmful gases formed as a result of burning a fuel into harmless gases before they're emitted. So there's two examples, arsenic with biological enzymes and lead destroys the catalytic converter in a car's exhaust system. So that's their properties. Number one, they are recovered chemically unchanged. Number two, they're specific. Number three, the presence of a catalyst is all that's required. Number four, if they're dealing with a reversible reaction, both reactions are uh, altered to the same degree. And number five, if they're introduced to a poison like lead, or in this case here, like arsenic, they will be destroyed. And they will be destroyed to the point where they cannot be used again. So what type of catalysis do we have? When you introduce a catalyst, what does it actually do? How does it work? So you have A plus B making C plus D and you introduce catalyst Z. What does it actually do? Now, in an overall way, just to give you a very brief picture of what a catalyst does, it points out an alternative pathway for A plus B to form C plus D. And the alternative pathway is one that is less in energy. OK, so A plus B makes C plus D normally along this, this kind of a long winding pathway it takes a long time to get there what the catalyst will say is don't take that pathway i will provide you with an alternative pathway of lesser energy where you can get to c plus d much quicker now the question is how does it provide the alternative pathway and i need you to remember that okay there's an alternative pathway offered an alternative pathway that's the way i like to remember it that if you have A plus B journeying down towards C plus D along a certain pathway that's long and has a lot of energy requirements, what the catalyst will do is point out an alternative pathway that has less energy requirements, but still allows you to make C plus D in a much quicker time frame. So the first one is what we call heterogeneous catalyst. Now, the word hetero, the prefix hetero simply means different. Okay, and genus would kind of mean a phase. So you've got different phases. Now, what that means is that you're throwing a solid catalyst into a liquid reaction. All right. So, for example, go back to the demonstration I gave you two classes back when we had the conical flask and the hydrogen peroxide at the bottom and the little tiny, um, what would you say, container of powder hanging above it, ready to drop it in. OK, the hydrogen peroxide was liquid. The manganese dioxide was a black powder. The catalyst and the reactant are in different phases. One is liquid, one is solid. So because you're introducing a solid catalyst into a liquid reactant, you're dealing with what we call heterogeneous catalysis. And it simply, it simply means that the phases of the catalyst and the reactants are different. Try and think for a moment about what term I would use if the catalyst and the reactants were in the same phase. If I was to add in a liquid catalyst to a liquid reactant, if they're the same, well, then we change the prefix from hetero to homo and you get homogeneous catalysis. OK, and homogeneous catalysis, again, simply means same phase. All right. So therefore, you've got a solution of potassium iodide in a solution of hydrogen peroxide. Now, by the way, both of these will do the kind of the same thing. Manganese dioxide powder will speed up the rate at which hydrogen peroxide turns into hydro into um, oxygen and water. OK, and a solution of Ki will also speed up the rate at which hydrogen peroxide forms um, oxygen gas and water. One of them is in a powdered form, one of them is in solution form. So powder into liquid, heterogeneous. Solution into solution, 
That's what we call homogeneous catalysis. So the very first thing you'll always do when you're introducing a catalyst is ask yourself, is this an example of homogeneous catalysis? Is this an example of heterogeneous catalysis? Look at the catalyst, look at the reactants, same phase, homogeneous, different phases, heterogeneous. And then you've got autocatalysis. And autocatalysis, by its very name, are reactions that produce their own catalysts. So, for example, if you have A plus B giving C plus D, and C actually has a catalytic effect on A plus B, well, then we get what's called positive feedback. As the concentration of C begins to appear, it points out to A and B an alternative pathway to make more C and D. So the presence of C, as it begins to build up initially, will cause a huge change in the reaction rate between A and B, for the better. In this case here, we're talking about speeding things up. Okay, So autocatalysis is where the catalyst is one of the products produced. Now you can just take the A plus B example if you want to give it that way. You don't have to get into too much technical detail just yet. So it's one of the products produced by the reaction itself. For example, if you add in manganese plus 7 into iron plus 2, and in the presence of a high, uh, probably say an acid medium, the Mn plus 7 will turn into Mn plus 2. Now this Mn plus 2 is a catalyst, okay? Mn plus 2 has a lovely purple colour. Or sorry, it's no colour. Mn plus 7 is purple, Mn plus 2 is no colour, it's colourless. So the first thing you'll notice is the colour will change. So it'll go from purple to colourless. And as it goes colourless, the reaction's going to get faster. All right, because the colourless Mn plus 2 is building up in concentration as a product, but at the same time, not only is it a product, it's a catalyst. So therefore, it positively feeds back into Mn plus 7 plus Fe2 plus plus H plus and speeds that reaction up. So what we'll notice is the reaction will be slow initially, but as it begins to clear and more Mn plus 2 is produced, the reaction rate speeds up. Okay, So three types of catalysis, homogeneous, if they have the same phase catalyst and reactant. Heterogeneous, a different phase catalyst and reactant. And autocatalysis, where the catalyst is one of the products produced and therefore positively feeds back into the reaction and has an overall effect on the rate of the reaction, for the better, so it usually speeds it up. So the mechanisms involved. Now, these are two things. I'm just going to slow down a little bit here because we've talked about the type of catalysis. Same, different and automatic. Homogeneous, heterogeneous and auto. Okay, But how do the catalysts work? How do they show the alternative pathway? And we have two theories, Okay, and both can be verified as being um, in existence. Both do happen. I have a video which is on Google Classroom, which I would ask you to go and watch when you're finished this little section here on catalysts. One of them is called intermediate compound formation theory. Now, wah, 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 wah. intermediate compound formation theory. I want you to think about that. Intermediate. Now, intermediate always means middle, okay? The junior cert used to be called the intermediate certificate because it was in the middle of your secondary school. So intermediate compound formation. So something is happening, something is forming. Theory. So it's a suggestion as to how catalysts might work. And basically what this thing says is something like the following. A plus B give C plus D, okay? Now, it's a regularly slow chemical reaction I want to alter the rate of the reaction, so I introduce catalyst Z. The catalyst Z will bind with B and give you a new compound called BZ, onto which A can react far more quickly to give C plus D. So this is much, much faster. Okay, so let's say this is relatively slow. When you add in the catalyst, and the catalyst binds to B and gives you your intermediate compound, the intermediate compound reacts with A far more quickly. It still produces C and D, but it does so in a faster time. Okay. Now here's the amazing thing. When the reaction is finished, there's no A plus B left. So the Z is basically left on its own, and you have the products of C plus D at the end. So what happened? I added in Z, there it is. Z bound, compounded, or I suppose bonded, if you want to put another word, bonded with B, formed a compound, a new compound, which was only there in the middle of the reaction. And when the reaction was over, the catalyst was left behind chemically unchanged. Now, this is a situation where the catalyst gets involved in the chemistry. So it comes in, it bonds to B, forms an intermediate compound, speeds up the reaction, but at the end, 
it detaches away from B and it remains by itself as it was in the beginning. Therefore, it qualifies as a catalyst because it goes in as Z and it comes out as Z and both of those are chemically unchanged, see? So that's the very first theory that we have. The second theory we have, and I'll go over that in a second in, in the slides. The second theory we have is what we call surface adsorption theory. Forgive my handwriting. Surface ad adsorption theory. Now, I want you first of all in your heads to understand the difference between adsorption and absorption. If you put a sponge into water, the water will be absorbed, absorbed, AB, absorbed into, okay? If you put sellotape on the wall, it will adsorb to the wall. So when you have AD, that just means sticks to, okay? For all intents and purposes, if you want to really explain it in easy English. Adsorption means sticking to. So you have A plus B, all right? Let's just put A plus B in here like this as particles, A and B. Now, at the moment, A and B are all over the place, finding it difficult to find one another to bring about a chemical reaction. So you introduce catalyst Z again, okay? And this time you introduce catalyst Z as a solid. So now we're going to be dealing with what we would call heterogeneous catalysis. So Z comes in and immediately B gathers on the surface. So B gathers on the surface of Z and therefore increases in concentration. See that? So all the Bs stick to this thing. Now they don't chemically bond with it, they stick to the surface. Which means now the concentration of B around the catalyst has increased. And we should know from an earlier class that increasing concentrations means a faster rate of reaction. So now another way to say that would be if B gathers over the surface of Z, then A can find it easily. It builds up in concentration here. A therefore goes in for the kill and reacts with B on the surface of the catalyst. And when you form C and D, they fall off. So C falls off and D falls off as they are being made. Okay, so what are the two mechanisms? Intermediate compound formation theory. A plus B gives C plus D is the normal reaction. In comes catalyst Z. Z will chemically bond with B and give you a new compound that wasn't there in the beginning. But this new compound allows A and B to come together far more quickly to produce C and D. And when all A and B are used up, Z simply separates and goes back to being itself as it was in the beginning, meaning it is catalytic in nature. The second theory is what we call surface adsorption theory whereby you add in a solid catalyst. You have to have a surface for that, obviously. That's the key thing. I should have said that to you earlier. There must be a surface on your catalyst. And what happens on the surface of the catalyst is that one of the reactants builds up in concentration. It sticks to it, okay? And it builds up in concentration at that area. Higher concentration means faster reaction rate. So it pulls B into one space, which allows A to find it quite easily and therefore allows the reaction between A and B to happen far more quickly than if A and B were both out there floating in this liquid or floating in space, trying to find one another. So they're the two mechanisms that we actually have. Now, let's go through them on the slides. So homogeneous catalysis, what does that mean? When the phase of the catalyst and the phase of the reactants are the same, Homogeneous catalysis normally undergoes intermediate compound formation theory, and then heterogeneous catalysis normally undergoes what we call surface adsorption. And the reason for that is because hetero means different. Your catalyst must be in solid form. And because the catalyst is in solid form, there is a surface on the catalyst to which things can stick. Okay, so please make sure you understand those before we go on. Homogeneous catalysis means liquid catalyst, liquid reactant. What happens? Well, then we're going to have an intermediate compound formation, all right? Something's going to form in the middle, speed up the reaction, and then separate at the end. If you have a solid catalyst into a liquid reactant, then the solid catalyst offers its surface for the concentration of one of the reactants to build up on so that the chemical reaction can take place more quickly around the catalyst due to the higher concentration. Okay, so intermediate compound formation, just in more detail. It is used to explain homogeneous catalysis. So that means liquid catalyst, liquid reactant, okay? 
In this theory, one of the reactants forms an intermediate compound with the catalyst. The new compound reacts with the other reactant at a greater rate, and as the product is formed, the intermediate compound breaks down and the catalyst is returned chemically unchanged. And that's extremely important. Okay? Because if the catalyst is in any way changed, it ain't a catalyst. The biggest characteristic of a catalyst is that it goes in, does its job, and comes out exactly the same, chemically unaltered. Okay, there's a video there, which I'm also going to put up in Google Classroom, that you can watch yourselves, but it shows the intermediate compound formation theory in action. It shows the, the production of an intermediate compound that is only there in the middle of a chemical reaction, which speeds up the reaction and then disappears towards the end and returns the original catalyst. Quite an interesting experiment to watch. So take the following reaction. A plus B equals C. Very slow reaction. All right. What do we do? We add in catalyst X. Now, in this case, what does catalyst X do? Well, catalyst X is in liquid form, as are A and B. So we're dealing now with homogeneous catalysis. X will bond to A and it will form an intermediate compound of AX, which then reacts with B far more quickly to give the new product C and return the catalyst. See that? So A and B give C under normal steam, which is quite slow. Introduce X, which reacts with A to give you an intermediate compound AX. AX will react much more quickly with B to form C as we wish, and then it gives back C, or sorry, it gives back X as your catalyst unchanged. There's the catalyst at the beginning, there's the catalyst at the end. So potassium, sodium, tartrate, and cobalt ions in hydrogen peroxide. That's the video I want you to watch. It's on Google Classroom. As soon as we finish this lesson, go to Google Classroom, take a look at the video and see if you understand what the actual video is trying to teach you about intermediate compound formation. So we get a pink colour of the cobalt ions, which when they react and form the intermediate compound turns green. And then at the very end, goes back to being pink again. So pink at the beginning, slow. Then it turns green and gets very, very fast. And then it goes back to pink and stops. All right, and you can watch with your own eyes in the video. So what about surface adsorption catalysis? Well, surface adsorption has to be used when we're dealing with heterogeneous catalysis, where the catalyst is solid and the reactants are liquid. And what happens is the reactants A and B will build up on the surface of the solid catalyst. Now, when you build up on the surface of anything, the concentration increases. Now, that's the key thing. So you're building up on the surface of the catalyst, increasing concentration. And what does increasing concentration do? Increasing concentration, as we had before, always leads to a higher reaction rate, faster reaction rate, simple as that. So you're pulling the chemicals into one place around the surface of the catalyst in order to increase concentration so that you can increase the rate of reaction. Product C will then leave the surface of the catalyst, so it'll fall off again. So A and B will stick, or even one of them might stick. B might build up in concentration. A finds it, reacts with it. C is formed, and they fall off the surface. So that when the reaction is over, and you take out the solid catalyst, it's chemically unchanged. So an example would be, as we've said already, and this is the example I'm using, because I'm going to be referring to this next year. Platinum liquid, or platinum liquid, platinum metal, always used to add hydrogen to substances okay so in organic chemistry when we want to add hydrogen across a double or a triple bond platinum is going to be the catalyst that is preferred because it offers its surface to the reactants in order to allow hydrogen to add to an organic substance at a much faster rate than it would happen if it was left to its own devices Okay, so as I told you already, one of the greatest areas in the modern technology where the catalysts have been used is in the catalytic converter in a car. Okay, and the reason for the catalytic converter is in order to take the harmful gases that are produced when you're burning a fuel and to chemically change them into harmless substances before they leave the exhaust. Now, I suppose one of the greatest design flaws of a catalytic converter is that it doesn't operate until it gets to high enough temperature. So always the first couple of kilometres of your first journey in the morning, they don't engage the catalytic converter chemistry. OK, it's too cold. So it only works when it gets to a, a certain temperature, what we call an optimum temperature. So the first couple of kilometres of every journey of your car normally are always spitting out the noxious gases. However, when the catalytic converter heats up and goes into action, it then 
is able to turn the noxious gases into harmless ones, which then obviously is good for environmental purposes. It's a box, that's all it is, containing a honeycomb, which is coated with rhodium, platinum and palladium metals. Now, extremely expensive, more expensive than gold. Hence the reason at the moment why there's a huge spate of uh, theft of catalytic converters. People park their cars in the driveway, come out in the morning and the catalytic converter has been removed. Why? Because guys take them, they do reverse chemistry on them and they remove the platinum. And if they can get five or 600 catalytic converters, they can get a decent amount of platinum, which they then sell for big money because platinum is more expensive than gold. So these things are precious, not only precious to the environment, but also precious in terms of getting quick money for the proceeds of crime, etc., etc. Now, what's a honeycomb? When do we use honeycombs? In science, we normally use honeycombs when we want to have a huge surface area on which we want chemistry to happen. So the honeycomb is offering a surface, see? It's offering a very large surface, I should say. Very, very large surface. On which the rhodium, platinum and palladium metals are coated. Which means that again here, we're undergoing surface adsorption and um, catalysis. Surface adsorption catalysis. And because the honeycomb is solid, and the gases obviously are gaseous, that means we're using two different phases. So this is going to be heterogeneous catalysis. So that's the way you've got to think about catalysis. First of all, what's the state of the catalyst? Solid. What's the state of the reactants? Gas. Different phases, heterogeneous catalysis. Now, what's the mechanism behind heterogeneous catalysis? Answer, surface adsorption. Why? Because the catalyst is solid, offers its surface on which quicker chemistry can take place before the harmless gases are booted out the exhaust. These precious metals increase the rate of the following reactions. Carbon monoxide into carbon dioxide. Poison. Carbon monoxide is poisonous. It turns carbon monoxide into carbon dioxide. That's a naturally occurring atmospheric gas. Okay. It also takes nitrogen monoxide and nitrogen dioxide and turns them into harmless atmospheric nitrogen, N2. And don't forget, 78% of the Earth's atmosphere is already nitrogen. So by turning the harmful nitrogen oxides and nitrogen dioxides into nitrogen, we're simply putting in a naturally occurring gas into the atmosphere that has no effect on anything, okay? Now, by the way, why are they harmful? They're harmful because when they react with water, they form H2NO3, or HNO3 actually, nitric acid. Okay? And nitric acid is very, very strong and extremely corrosive. So if you have nitric acid falling from the sky, you're going to have buildings wearing away, statues losing their detail, etc., which has happened over the past uh, 100 or so years. So you've got to be very careful that these guys don't get into the atmosphere because if they do, they react with rainwater, they form nitrous or nitric acid, okay? and then which are both very, very strong and corrosive. So we need to take them out and turn them into nitrogen, which basically stays in the atmosphere and gets used by plants in order to produce proteins. And finally then, any unburned hydrocarbons. Well, if there are unburned hydrocarbons, what will happen? The catalytic converter will turn them into water and carbon dioxide. Now, I hope you notice CO to CO2, you're adding oxygen, yeah? HC, into CO2 and H2O, you're adding oxygen. So the catalytic converter is also very, very um, dependent on a fresh flow of atmospheric oxygen to cause these chemical reactions to happen. Also, we need high temperatures because high temperatures are responsible for faster reaction rates. So you have air being brought in to produce the or to provide the oxygen. You have high temperatures in order to speed up the reaction, and you have three catalysts: rhodium, platinum, and palladium, which also speed up the reaction of harmful carbon monoxide into harmless carbon dioxide, harmful nitrogen monoxide and nitrogen dioxides into harmless nitrogen gas, and finally harmful unburnt hydrocarbons into harmless carbon dioxide and harmless water. Okay. Whoops, it is. Now I'm spoiling all my secrets and all my surprises. So what does it look like? Well, it's here. It's placed between, obviously, between the engine and the exhaust. So this is where the burning fuel takes place. Your fuel is burnt in the engine. Okay, so the engine is here and your fuel is burnt. Then the gases pass through the catalytic converter 
which must be at a high enough temperature in order to be able to do the job before the catalysts will become optimally primed and do the job they're supposed to do. So a high temperature catalytic converter, the gases pass through and those chemical reactions we've just spoken about a moment ago, they occur here and then out of the exhaust, what do you have? Nitrogen, carbon dioxide and water. Okay, what's formed in the engine? Carbon monoxide, nitrogen monoxide, nitrogen dioxide and unburnt HCs. They're all dangerous. What happens at the other end? What comes out? Nitrogen, carbon dioxide and water. Harmless, naturally occurring atmospheric gases. And they happen, as I told you already, by means of a honeycomb. And as I told you, a honeycomb is always used when we want to have a large surface area folded into a small space so that we can get, i.e. a large surface area giving us good chemical reactions happening very, very quickly. OK, and there you see them going in. Unburnt hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide and either nitrogen monoxide or nitrogen dioxide. In they go. Temperature of the catalyst, I think, should be about 600 degrees. I'm not 100% sure of the temperature, roughly about 600 degrees. And then the three-way catalyst of what? Palladium, platinum and rhodium. OK, those three metals in here will then turn these harmful gases into harmless ones. And in case you can't remember that, I've got the final diagram here on the catalytic converter, which shows you exactly what takes place. It doesn't make any mention of temperature, but I think the colour tells you that it has to be quite hot before it's going to do the job it's supposed to do. OK, that's the end of today's class. That's your catalyst studied in detail. And you've got your everyday example of the catalytic converter working at a high temperature, containing three catalysts, giving you a honeycomb for large surface area, proving that heterogeneous catalysis takes place by what we call surface adsorption. I want you now to go and watch the video in terms of intermediate compound formation theory and then take a little while maybe to write the notes in relation to this section into your chemistry copies before we move on tomorrow to finish the section in relation to um, catalysts and in relation to the rates of reaction um, in terms of catalysts and, and the mechanisms behind them.